So should I? Hello, everyone. Welcome Hi. to Double A's Publishing. Hi. <laughs> How are you, <laughs> Yingji? <laughs> great, great. That's great. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, all things considered, in the current uh, current pandemic epic. We're, yeah. doing, we're doing okay. Uh, so everyone, welcome. Uh, we are here at the uh, AAS Author Series, and we're going to be covering a classic today. And I say a classic because it comes from 2010. Oh, don't be so shy. Um, <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit my motivation for why we're picking this paper. You know, I, I do want to get sort of both current papers and classics in the field. So let me show you what motivated one of the reasons that motivated me to take this paper on mass and environment as drivers of galaxy evolution in SDSS and Z Cosmos and the origin of the Schechter function. So as some of you may know, I, I have uh, an interest in the evolution of the most cited astronomy and astrophysics articles and the journals that they're published in. And this is an evolution of papers that were published in 2010. So you start over here uh, on the left and it's the top 50. So in 2010, there were 50 papers that had the most citations. Then you go to the end of 2011, there will be another set of 50 papers with the most citations. Some of those in 2011 with the most citations may not be the same ones that had the top 50 citations in 2010. And so you march through over time and you're watching then the evolution of the top 50 most cited articles that were published in 2010. The one we're covering today, uh, Mass and Environment, uh, published in 2010, of course, and it entered the top 50 in about 2012. And you can see that it's had quite uh, an interesting trajectory uh, up to 2019. It's doing a steady rise, and it is currently number 10, current epoch, is the 10th most cited paper published in 2010. Uh, it's got a, uh, uh, a steadily growing trajectory you can see there, and we'll have to see where it goes as we head into 2020, 2021. So this is sort of my motivation for picking this paper from 2010. And so uh, Ying Ji uh, is, where are you currently at? You're at uh, Kabli in Beijing? Yes, yes Kabli Institute at Peking University. Okay. Uh, so you're not at uh, the Institute for Astronomy uh, Zurich anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a long time ago, but it's a, it's a wonderful place. Cool. All right, I'm going to let you take it away. Let's go ahead and walk through this, this article. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so this paper, what we did is really, um, well, the paper is out 10 years ago, but we started to... Um, we started this project um, with, with my supervisor, Simon Lilly. So we started with a cosmos, based, basically based, uh, based on this a cosmos project. <clears throat> so we have been working on that project for many years. The paper itself, this paper itself, had been working for three years. So it's, we, we, um, that's, that's actually my first paper. I spent a lot of time into this uh, into this project uh, because um, uh, because one thing. Um, what, what's required from, from Simon is that he has a special requirement, which means um, if you check your readouts, you publish some papers, you check this um, readouts 10 years later, where your plot still seems about correct. Well, that's a, that's a quite st a stringent requirement. So that's, we, we, we put a lot of things um, in time, efforts um, into them um, to correct all this kind of statistical data because it's based on the uh, surveys. Um, SDSS and Z Cosmos, uh -huh. like the Z Cosmos with all, all our uh, wonderful colleagues uh, in the Z Cosmos team, we have been working on um, all this kind of statistic um, co corrections for for a long time. For for instance, when we are uh, doing the select functions, selection functions, uh, how the samples are defined, and and try to correct all this kind of uh, incompleteness and bias and that that take one year just to do all these kind of corrections. So eventually, this paper is um, um, uh, we're quite happy um, and, uh, and people like it. Uh, it's uh, useful useful to the communities. And and I think the well, there are several several things um, important things about the, this papers. The first thing is, is we uh, we show uh, let's uh, let's say the figure six in this papers shows the red fraction. Um, quench fraction as function of 
um, Stellar and environment using the SDSS data. So basically, it tells us how the galaxies got crunched. Um, this depends on both the internal drivers, which is is correlated with stellar mass, and um, and is also um, heavily depends on the environment with where the galaxy living, which represents the external environment. So both the internal and external factors are important in 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 driving the the the, the death or the, the crunching of the galaxy properties. And then um, following on this, we also using the day cosmos data to check this um, this results and up to Russia one, and we, we find it's a similar similar results, so which is really nice. So we uh, in this papers we coined uh, we coined the terms mass crunching uh, for the first time. So the mass crunching this this, this term is um is, is purely empirical and uh, phenomenological. Um, we don't know what's the physics, so this um, mass crunching. Uh, the, the co the, we call it mass crunching simply because um, the crunched fraction or the fraction of the dead galaxies is a strong function of the stellar mass. So, so, so we call it mass crunching. We're still looking for what's the physical mechanism for, for the mass crunching. Is it, um, let's say it's agent feedback or stellar feedback or other things. Yeah, we're still looking for that. But these terms, um, it, it, it's a nice, to, it's a, um, um, nice simple uh, uh, terms to describe the crunching in front observations. Because in series, we have many, many terms to describe how the galaxy crunch, but, in, but um, we are observers, so, so we, 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 we trust data. So the, this paper is entirely based on observations. So we're using observational data and, and take this phenomenological approach and try to use the data to tell us what's, what's the most important aspect of the galaxy population. So the first thing is we're looking for the, um, how the crunched um, uh, fractional galaxies as functional different um, properties. And later we started looking at the uh, stellar mass function uh, to, the, uh, to starting how the stellar mass function in all the star forming galaxies and passive galaxies involved in different environments from Russia one to Russia zero. Yeah, so, so from, from that, we built, um, uh, uh, we built a simple phenomenological model to describe that. And we find our mass crunching is um, quite, success, quite, quite successful. It explained, um, uh, can explain the sector form of the mass function. Uh, still, uh, we don't know what's the physics, but, um, but, but this mass crunching law is we, what we derive from, from data. This is the data tells us if the mass function want to involve in this way, as, as observed, it must have this kind of mathematical forms. It's a very simple form, just depends on the star formation rate of the galaxies, and also depends on the um, M star, the characteristic mass of the sector function. So putting, based on this simple effect, we build um, a simple um, simulations, um, just based Monte Carlo simulations, and which can beautifully reproduce um, the observation, the observed stellar mass function. Actually, at that time, it um, reproduced the, the most accurate the stellar mass function than, than any models. It is almost perfectly um, can predict the observed mass function evolution. So that's a, that's a, that's a huge success. That's why we call the mass crunching law, which actually produced the sector form, um, especially the exponential cutoff at the massive end. And I guess, I, I think in my mind, that's, that's, that's the two most important um, aspects of this paper. It's, it's had many different things because um, not, not only details, the things that we want to deliver the message is how people should think about, um, is it pro provide a framework and how people can use this framework um, or the tools to, to interpret your data. Yeah, basically in short, in your nutshell, it's, um, it's like this. I have a question. Can you describe the, on figure six, uh, can you describe the y-axis a little bit for me? What do you mean by log of one plus delta over density? Oh, yeah. The, um, the y-axis environment is, is, is that's over density. Um, the delta is, um, is uh, over density, that's the row, the density, um, well, you can character, first you can character environment by using different terms. You can use, let's say, halo masses. Uh, you can um, uh, 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 the, uh, the group, but you can use that as um, uh, environment characteristics. Or you can count in a fixed apertures um, how many galaxies inside these apertures. And here we use the so-called the nearest labor, so the distance to the fifth nearest labor. Um, 
So for every galaxy, we count the distance to the fifth nearest neighbor using that distance uh, to its character, how, them, how crowd is um, um, uh, of the galaxy populations. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Good, thanks. Cool. Any other figures you want to look at in this? Or call attention to? Yes, so, so basically six, figure six is in the SDSS and then figure seven, we, 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 we use the Zay Cosmos data and check this results um, to higher ratio to ratio uh, one. That's a, that's a best sample um, um, can be explored by, by the uh, Zay Cosmos project um, until ratio one. And, um, And then later, actually, we defined the two terms. We defined um, which now is commonly used for, for similar uh, research um, is the so-called environment quenching efficiency and mass quenching efficiency. Um, this two efficiency uh, shows in figure eight, which shows how um, to characterize uh, how efficient the environment or the mass um, can help to crunch um, crunch the galaxies. So uh, for instance, the upper panel figure eight shows when you go to denser environment, for instance, you go to from you go from field to get a field environment to cluster environment, the galaxy is about um, quenching efficiency rise from zero to hundred percent, which means you go to clusters, all your galaxies eventually will get crunched. Um, similar things, uh, the mass quenching efficiency is um, shown in the lower panel to show how the efficiency of the uh, mass, which is correlated with uh, quenching. Um, again, uh, then later we always check or compare the SDS data with the Cosmos to show how the, the things is involved with, with, with time. And, and again, uh, I think one of the most important part uh, is, um, or more important part actually is the later half of the papers. Uh, actually, most of the citation received in this paper is in the first um, half of the papers. Um, which is uh, more about the obser uh, observational part of the scaling relations. But the, the most important thing is the later part about the mass functions. Uh, we, is increasing, um, we have re received increasing more citations, but uh, still much less than the first uh, half. The, fir the second half is about the mass function evolution, because in my mind, um, if you describe the galaxy populations or any um, populations, um, uh, standard populations or human, uh, human populations, you need just basically two things. One is the scaling relations, and another one is distribution functions to describe how the parameters the distribution um, uh, looks like. And mass function tells me that um, how, how the standard mass distribute uh, uh, um, in different environment. And, and uh, how it involved with time. So uh, the later half, uh, the, uh, half uh, of the papers shows the mass function evolutions, and from uh, from a high redshift um, to to the SDS data, and is from that one we. Is there a figure avoid... you're looking at? Is there a figure you want to look yes. at? Yes, um, figure twelve. Uh, figure twelve is first we shows the observations, show the data, how the uh, observed uh, mass function looks like for star-forming galaxies, uh, which is in the left mm -hmm. panel. Uh, star-forming galaxies, um, the, the, blue, the blue curves uh, uh, in different environment. And the right panel shows the mass function of the passive galaxies sees in different environment. Okay. So you can see for star-forming galaxies, uh, the, the blue points, it can be fitted with a single sector function. But for the passive galaxies, it's not, you cannot fit with a single sector function anymore. It's a top sector function. You have two components. And so that's, that's, that's a feature, so the crunching, which, which, which the primary structure function, um, including the exponential, exponential cut, uh, cut, um, uh, cut off part at the massive end, that mm -hmm. one, well, the primary mode is crunched by what we call mass crunching uh, by these terms. And the power law part, the power part looks like this. The power law part uh, is controlled by the environment crunching. So these two crunchings, um, uh, crunching uh, terms, uh, crunching process, which to two separate crunching channels pro, um, controls this, this, this two component of the sector function of the passive galaxies, which, which is, well, by the way, so, so when we um, see this plus and plus another incredibly important observations uh, from the previous uh, observation, um, from redshift three to redshift zero, is that the shape, the shape of the, uh, mass function of the star-forming galaxies mm -hmm. keeps 
um, incredibly similar, the same, especially the M star characteristic and the mass M star is the same from redshift two to redshift zero. And from that, uh, we can build, uh, we can build, uh, we can derive from the continuity equations. That's what we call it continuity approach. From the continuity approach, um, now equations we can derive what's, what this means. Uh, we transfer this uh, this observation into one equation. That's what that what, what, what that's what, what we call mass quenching law. Yeah, in this sense, uh, the continuity approach is um, is the best is one of the most uh, efficient tools to describe the evolution of the mass function. Um, a bit, bit, bit because um, yeah, it's just designed to do that. So so um, we can derive go through all the equations and to derive um, to, uh, strictly what the mass quenching law looks like. That's the equation. Um, Let's see, um, let's 27, see. 28? Yes, yes, that's a 20, a 20, a 23, uh, equation 23 or 24. Okay. Yeah, so the mass quenching rate is, is equal to star formation rate derived by M star. Uh, the M star is fixed. It just observed um, a Schechter, uh, Schechter M star. So this, this equation tells us if you have higher star formation rate, you have a higher chance uh, to be crunched. Uh, that, that, that is that that's a really simple as simple as that or you can it, it's crunching rate so one over the crunching rate tells me the um, time scales the crunching time scales or um uh, or how long i can st stay on st stay as a star forming galaxies before i get crunched if the star formation rate is very really high which means the crunching rate is very really high which means the crunching time scale is very really short Mm -hmm. This tells me directly tells me at the peak of the star formation um, the history at rush of two, um, all the galaxies have higher stock on average have higher stock formation rate twenty times higher than the local universe, which okay. means the crunching time scale will be will be the twenty times shorter. So in other universe you might take several gig years to crunch galaxies, but in high rush of rush of two it probably take half gig years or even shorter time uh, to crunch galaxies. Okay. And this is what exactly what we observed from the alpha uh, element enhancement because the high rush the massive galaxies have a much shorter um, 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 quantum oh. time scales in order to enhance the alpha element. Otherwise, this 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 is one of the predictions we also see. Uh, well, we have many um, different predictions, and this is one of the predictions we show in figure um, uh, figure eighteen. Um, so probably the last figure. So the figure 18 shows, shows, uh, shows, shows how this kind of um, direct consequence of the mass quenching law, which means you must crunch in the massive galaxies faster um, than the low-mass galaxies. So, um, so from, from this mass quenching law and, and predict, the, uh, we can predict the mass function, how the mass, mass function evolved. Uh, that shows in figure 13. So um, in figure um, 13, um, the upper panels, upper panels show, shows the predict the mass function for star forming galaxies and passive galaxies um, in, in dense environment and under dense environment. That's the left panel is for the under dense regions and the right panel is for in the dense regions and how the mass function involved from rush of uh, three to rush of zero and the square. The black square in the upper panel is the data, is the data, and the gray curve is the predictions. So as you can see, uh, the prediction from the simple phen phenomenological models, the gray curve matches the data, the, um, the black squares extremely well, extremely well. And we don't have, um, we don't have much free parameters. I, I think we, all the, all the parameters in this model is determined directly from the data. So we have zero tolerance to tune the parameters. We, we don't tune because there's no, 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 um, no room to tune the parameters. Everything is from the, derived from the data. So, um, so eventually the prediction matches the observation um, mass function extremely well. The lower panel in figure 13 shows a red fraction as function of stellar mass. Again, um, left panel um, under dense regions, the right panel in the dense environment. And the red fraction or crunched, uh, crunched fraction also matches the data extremely well. So um, this, this is best checked um, um, by the SDS data in the local universe. Of course, um, the next step is to check um, if it's true in at higher redshift uh, when we have um, 
upcoming uh, notch spectroscopy surveys at Russia 1.5 and Russia 2. Okay. That's the future, yeah. Awesome. So are you working on some of those uh, current and future surveys now? Yeah, actually, there are several things we, we want to do after this paper. Um, um, the, um, the first thing is in, in this paper, uh, we're dealing with, um, with um, stellar populations of the galaxy populations. Um, most of the stars, the stellar mass and other um, star formation rate is all about the stellar population. So, so next step, we want to also bring the gas content. That's, that's the next important um, um, step forward is um, um, me and my collaborators and many other people, we using this so-called gas reg regulation models uh, for, uh, to bring in the gas content into, um, uh, into these pictures. Because if we want to understand how the galaxies get crunched or how galaxies dead, how star formation rate, uh, how star formation stop, you must know what happened to the gas. And also, um, in our previous uh, uh, pictures, is we um, we try to differentiate between star forming and crunching. But actually, if you put um, um, these galaxies in the Kennecott Schmidt nor the star formation nor you find mm -hmm. probably it's the same process controlling both star formation and crunching. And and well, but you have different boundary conditions for for some galaxies. They can keep form stars, uh, keep for form star, forming stars on this so-called galaxy star forming sequence. And other galaxies get crunched. But if you check what's the gas content and star formation efficiency in these galaxies, you find probably the crunch galaxies and star forming galaxies they follow a single um, star formation law. So we also need to bring in the gas content in, 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 into the, these pictures that involve both um, molecular gas and, and atomic gas and hot gas in future. So, so we want to understand how the gas is playing, playing a role in this, um, in, in this pictures. That's why um, that's the first thing. And also we want to add that in um, naturally the chemical evolution of the galaxies, uh, including how the metal involved in the galaxies. That's why later uh, in, in 2015, uh, um, me and Roberto Melino, we put one, one, one paper on nature uh, to show we use the standard metallicity uh, as a tracer uh, to trace how the galaxies are crunched. Uh, you, you are the expert in the standard mm -hmm. populations and you see um, the gas, normally people are, you, um, is, um, um, often people are studying the gas metallicity, but the gas metallicity uh, can change quite quickly with time because the gas content itself can change um, um, quite quite rapidly with you know short time scales. But the standard metallicity is described is the average average metals in the stars, and that's uh, keep a memory of in what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So we compare what's the metallicity um, uh, standard metallicity in star forming galaxies and in passive galaxies at the same standard mass and using these tracers and, and tell us how the galaxy got crunched. Got it. So the, conclu the conclusion is that the low mass galaxies um, and the middle mass are, or the mass below the Schechter M star are crunched in the local universe, are crunched by the so-called strangulation, which means uh, when, when the galaxy um, the first they are forming stars because they have gas, and then um, when they get crunched, you cannot instantaneously strike all the gas away. So if you instantaneously take all the gas away, the star formation stop in a very short time scale. And the standard magnetic will not change because it will not have time to form some um, stars with high metal, um, uh, high metal magnetic. So the another scenario we favored is like, uh, when you crunch your galaxies, you do not take the gas away, but you cut the gas supply, cut the gas inflows. So the galaxies, every galaxy have some gas reservoirs, and then you cut the gas inflows, it turns into a, something like a closed box um, uh, systems. Right. So the galaxies just form stars using its remaining gas, and then a gas also explode and it, um, pollute the, the arriving gas. So the gas magnetic will first rise and the stand magnetic will also rise. So when you compare the crunched galaxies with the star forming galaxies, you will find the crunched dead galaxies will have a higher stand magnetic. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's really what we found in this um, short, short, short letters. And then, uh, indeed, that's what we observed in the local universe uh, at the same stand mass the crunched data galaxies have much higher stellar than the star-forming ones. 
and that's why we call it strangulation, uh, which is um, quenching mechanisms for uh, for this uh, galaxy below M star. But somehow, uh, again, we all dealing with um, this kind of observations. We don't know what caused the strangulation, uh, what kind of physical mechanisms did that. Right. So that's uh, one important thing that's um, uh, difficult. That's uh, difficult um, formed by all observers. And how can we cause some observation with physical mechanisms? Uh, this can cause a link or the connection is missing. And that's why we turn into also more and more into simulations. Um, using all the kind of illustrial TNT and fire ego, all the kind of simulations well, trying to compare the data to see if we can find some clues. Because eventually we need the physical mechanism, physics, not only not only some some observational facts. So yeah, so the gas content is um, is is very important and and. So the next step, and we said we have been waiting this for, for almost 10 years, because like um, at back to 2010, uh, VEMOS, that's an that's, that's instrument on the, um, on the VRT, that's the most powerful instrument to do the most um, the spectroscopy uh, surveys. But, but you know, at that time, people, uh, the, uh, that instrument uh, is not really designed to do uh, SDSs like survey at Russia too. You need some fiber-based um, um, based machines to increase multiplex, uh, which means you can do the um, uh, for for so so now uh, we we about to have these two major instruments. One is the moons. Uh, the moons uh, is an instrument will be installed on on VRT. Uh, will be running uh, probably next year. It's cool. leading by the Euro. So yeah, that that will have one thousand fibers. Have yeah, and have. Far in, I have no have have near infrared cameras, so we can do finally we can do rush one and a half um, SDS like surveys, and another instrument is um, uh, uh, is a PFS. The, um, the PFS is um, uh, is a similar instrument um, will be installed on the Shubaru. It's also it also expect to observe uh, probably next year. So mm -hmm. this is this two major instrument will be able to do the spectroscopy surveys at Russia two and uh, one and a half. That's a peak of the star, cosmic star formation history, uh, and 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 we can get the spectroscopy. So that's uh, that that's uh, the most um, um, exciting project that I'm looking uh, looking forward to. And so, uh, for the and and part of the Moon's team, so so we have um, people have been working hard for this project for for for, for many years, for for, for five years or uh, numbers, and people are, are working on now to do, to finalize the um, um, observation strategies and many many things. Um, so 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 hopefully um, f for the next few years we, we will be connecting the data um, from these two surveys and we can do all this stuff again at Russia one and a half. That's very exciting, and that's what eventually that's what the missing piece because the Redshift Dirt Desert, that's that's what we call Redshift Desert, Redshift one and a half with the optical instrument like BRT. It's very hard to identify Redshift and, and and in that Redshift range. So with the near infrared instrument, finally we can do it nicely with all this kind of. Uh, emission lines, the uh, H alpha and oxygen, right. and so we can do the metanistes and we can do uh, many, many other exciting science. And it finally, it will help to check uh, if, if if my my model or my pictures and how how to look uh, looks like uh, with this new data. Yeah. So in long term, in in probably um, even longer, probably five to ten years. Um, uh, eventually, if the MSC uh, will will be funded, that will be ultimate machines uh, to do the survey with the 11.25 meters uh, giant uh, telescope, nice. and it's, it's it's only for for for, for fibers um, of spectroscopy observations plus the uh, ARSST, and these two major instruments will work together to do all those kind of surveys, one in photo uh, for photometric and one in um, the spectroscopy follow-up. And plus SKA, SK will be running uh, in 10 years, so, so, so that's what will bring us, I guess, how the gas is involved, uh, involved um, um, in these pictures. Because in, um, as I said, uh, we need both um, uh, the, uh, the gas in different phase, molecule gas and atomic gas. And molecule gas is pretty hard uh, if you want to do the CO surveys. Um, so people still do the sub, sub millimeters um, surveys. And, and, but uh, H1, uh, this um, uh, SK can push this to, um, because now we don't have uh, direct observation of the atomic gas at high Russia 
higher than 0.5. Mm -hmm. So, so if we want to know what the uh, atomic gas looks um, content looks like at redshift one, we must uh, have to wait until SK is running. So all this kind of major instrument will be in, uh, bringing or including the JWST and ERT and uh, uh, TMT. Oh, but well, all this um, major instrument will be bringing us um, a, a complete uh, picture. So how the galaxy population involve cross cosmic time, because we cannot, galaxy population is very really complicated. It's not only the stars, it's also the gas, also the metal, and, and with the black hole inside the, the AGN and all the things, we can, one uh, instrument or one, um, one service cannot tell us all. Oh, we must bring in all this kind of pictures, all the pieces. Um, that's why I think, I, I think the, well, it's complicated. It's really complicated. Uh, many people believe in galaxies, so we, we don't have a series to describe how the galaxy form and evolve with time. Yeah, so, 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 um, so it, it is complicated, but, but, but with all this kind of major instrument and, 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 and um, the forthcoming data, I think we will eventually be able to describe or understand how the physics drives the galaxy evolution across cosmic time. And, and I think one of the, yeah, that, that, that's why I think this field is very bright. I'm very, uh, quite looking forward to, 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 to the futures and that'd be great, wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> and that yeah. is a perfect ending point. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, that's, that's why I think why this paper, so the, the, the 2010 paper, uh, the paper have high citations because, well, there's many people and there's um, uh, people um, uh, do, do, doing similar stuff. And also, uh, one of the important things, this, 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 this question has not been solved. Yeah. If the question has been solved, then people will not do, do things that will not sign this paper. You can do anything. All done. Yeah. Well, so, so, so in ten years we have made a great process, but, but, but still, a lot of things have not been solved. So we need um, all this. We're building all this kind of major instrument and all this kind of following up work, and eventually, I think we we, we will be able to do that. Well, I look forward to your paper that. Um, puts a nail in it and says, now it's a solved problem. Yeah. <laughs> and that will be a very high-sided paper. Yeah. Cool, very good. Yingzhi, I wanna thank you so much for um, spending some time today talking us through your, your, your wonderful paper. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll see everyone on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.